Okay, well, thank you for having me. If, uh, if you have problems in hearing me, just ask me to project a little more. I'm pleased to do that. And it's nice to be back up at DU. Uh, any excuse to come down to Denver and enjoy the, uh, the fine city. So um, I'm going to start off uh, talking about the intersection between climate and environmental change and, and global health, because it's actually quite ancient. As you you may recall um, the intersection between weather and climate and human health has been known since Hippocrates. In fact, if you read some of Hippocrates' original works, they were actually on this subject itself. Um, recently, the WHO estimated that the burden of disease from global climate change was resulting in 150,000 excess deaths per annum. That's actually pretty significant because um, Previous estimates were about half of that. Other things going on, uh, for some time we've known that there is a strong association between the health of a population and, and what we call state capacity or the resilience, uh, the capacity of a state to adapt to multiple stressors uh, and strains. If you want to read some really interesting work on the development of nations as associated uh, with health, I would read Robert Fogel's work from 1994. He wrote a paper in 1994 for the National Bureau of Economic Research wherein he stressed that investments in health led to increased productivity and greater ingenuity in the British population, allowing them uh, to be the first European nation to industrialize. And Fogel won the Nobel Prize for that work, in fact. So there's some very interesting uh, work on this. How, uh, years ago, discovered that health is in fact a greater driver of state capacity than the obverse. People always assumed that state capacity would in fact drive health outcomes when in fact once we took the data and lagged it in a reciprocal fashion over 8 to 15 years, we found that in fact health drives state capacity to a greater degree than, uh, than the obverse and that was counterintuitive. The, those are findings that I had back in 2002 have now been tested multiple times in multiple journals by independent researchers and they're robust. All right, so that's an interesting finding. I'd like to do another test on that, perhaps involving some DU students in the future with a greater data set and so forth. Um, but that's uh, surprising and resilient. Historically, as many of you probably know, disease, infectious disease, generated class and ethnic conflict in Europe, uh, cholera, Yersinia pestis, the Black Death. There are a number of books on this, of course, and we can talk about that to a greater degree later. The argument that I'm going to make to you all today um, is that global climate change will in fact result in disease emergence and recrudescence. And it, uh, even more than that, it's going to involve shifting terrain for the disease in terms of the human population. So zones of endemicity all right, are going to shift over time depending upon the pathogen we're talking about. Um, it may induce some problems of governance at different levels of scale. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to be a hypochondriac about this. I don't want to say disease is going to cause this global meltdown. That's not true, but it might cause some interesting, um, interesting complications in certain regions of the world. Okay, so let's get to some data here. Um, these are annual precipitation trends from 1900 to 2000. This is measured by the IPCC. And uh, again, I looked for more recent data out of them uh, into 2010, but this is the best data that they've provided to date. As you can see, certain portions of the world are getting much wetter. Uh, obviously, uh, the northern latitudes, um, portions of Australia, South America, and so forth. And obviously, places like West Africa, uh, the Sahel region are really drying out, right? Next, temperature data. This is interesting because, again, where are the dominant warming patterns on the planet occurring? Well, they're occurring primarily in the northern latitudes, right? And again, this is going to have an effect upon the vectors that transmit pathogens and even upon uh, pathogen replication rates, which I'll get into in a little bit. By the way, we can come back to all of this uh, during the question period if you'd like. In terms of global climate change, well, let's, let's break it up a little bit. Uh, this is some of the most recent data I took off the IPCC website a couple weeks ago. And this 
clearly shows warming patterns broken up by the continents. All right? It also breaks it down according to global, global land, and global ocean warming trends. All right? Again, these are all over uh, the past century, pretty much. And it shows a very robust trend towards warming on the planetary surface. I don't really need to get into, I don't think, the anthropocentric versus uh, the Milankovitch cycles deal about climate change. We can get into all of that, and that's fun for me, uh, but um, we'll come back to it. So now here's the critique part. Some of the obvious problems in seeing climate change as a driver of disease are that there are multiple confounding factors, and I'm sure all of you can think about many. Um, there are demographic drivers involved in this including uh, human migration from certain zones. There are housing issues. Obviously, uh, people or societies with better housing are going to have greater resilience in the face of things like malaria, Chagas disease, and so forth. Changes in land use, health infrastructure and access, socioeconomic development. Um, many of these critiques are summed up in uh, the famous article by Lafferty in 2009. It's actually a very interesting article, and Lafferty sought to dismantle this notion that climate change would, in fact, uh, drive disease. So I, I would suggest that you read Lafferty for a good critique of, of some of this other work. Um, the question that I had in my mind, of course, is, even though I'm a political scientist, is there a robust signal right, from climate change driving disease emergence and transition? And after reviewing a lot of the, the best, most recent work, I would say, yes, uh, it's faint, but it does seem to be there. The best way of detecting signals from climate change as they interact with pathogens, or with disease in general, is through the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Okay? And there's some very interesting work done on that. Uh, Banks and Subiato, Lindsay, Gagnon, Buma, Chavez, and Conrad. The Chavez and Conrad article, which just came out last, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago, is actually very good because they go through all the literature. So if you guys are, are global health students, you might want to read that. Um, by the way, I'm going to leave this presentation with Randall. So if you want to go through my footnotes and citations and look for the authors, uh, you're certainly welcome to. Another thing I'd argue is that scale matters. Um, one reason people are missing the signal from climate change is that they're looking at it through different levels of scale. If you only look at it through a macro level lens, you may miss some of the finer changes occurring on, on uh, micro level issues and, and vice versa. So you have to be really cognizant of what scales we're looking at depending upon the pathogens and vectors involved. Um, we'll start with malaria because of course it's so ubiquitous throughout the tropical regions. Um, malaria incidence, as you probably know, is associated with increasing temperature and rainfall. Um, there are a number of good studies on this in India, Pakistan, Botswana, South Africa, and we can go on and on and on. Those are just some of the more famous studies on this. Um, precipitation, and SST stands for sea surface temperatures, are very strong indicators of malaria incidence. So if we go back to the charts about global uh, change in terms of sea surface temperatures, you're going to see that that correlates pretty highly with uh, malaria incidence. Recently, Schumann, in a very interesting article, uh, found that a temperature increase on the planet of 2 to 3 degrees, which is right in, right in line with moderate IPCC estimates for the next 50 years, is actually going to increase the population, global population at risk for malaria by 3 to 5 percent. Okay? That may not sound enormous to all of us here in North America, but when you think about certain zones of the developing world, that can translate into a pretty significant burden of disease. Um, what do we expect from the theory? One would expect that malaria is going to expand its range in terms of both latitude, so it's going to spread from the tropics towards the poles, but it's also going to move around in terms of altitude. Now, what does this mean? Some cities in, uh, in Africa, such as Nairobi, which are built at a very high altitude, were in fact built there because they were originally malaria-free. Unfortunately, as the evening temperatures, and this is the key, as the evening temperatures increase, the vectors, the mosquitoes, can now survive longer, and malaria has moved up into that population. That population doesn't have a lot of immunity to the, uh, the parasite, the plasmodium, so in fact they're getting exposed to it at greater levels, and it's damaging them. Other things according to temperature which are interesting, um, 
the plasmodium uh, that is the malaria parasite, its replication rate actually increases. So as you jack up temperatures, right, as you increase temperatures, the actual parasite's reproduction rate is going to increase dramatically. And there are certain thresholds built into that. The other thing we could do is we could stick my arm in a box, all right, full of mosquitoes. I mean, I'd rather do this with mica, but we could, we could put my arm in a box. And as we crank up the temperature on that box, what are we going to see? We're going to see that the biting rate um, of the vector, in this case, Anopheles mosquitoes, is going to increase as well. Well, what does that mean collectively? It means that as you crank up temperatures, then the effect on the human host is going to be multiplied, right? Increasing the burden of disease on populations that haven't been exposed to malaria before. Is there evidence of this? Yeah, there is. Uh, Pasquale, 2006, and, and people who now cite Pasquale say that, well, Lafferty was sort of wrong, right? In the sense that he dismissed climate change entirely as affecting uh, the burden of disease because, in fact, in the eastern African highlands, we're now seeing evidence to contradict Lafferty. So that's interesting. One of the most fascinating studies, though, that contradicts Lafferty or undermines his claims is that climate factors have the most dramatic effect on transmission in nations where, and you can read this, where GDP per capita is below $20,000 per annum. Right? which means that the effect is differentiated according to levels of development. That's important. Lafferty did not look at that. Right? He used a more uh, ubiquitous analysis than this. So in other words, in the poorest countries, and many of them, of course, as you know, uh, have much lower levels of GDP per capita than 20000 per year, that's where you're likely to see these effects be most pronounced. All right, cholera. Well, I'm not going to spend too long on cholera, but cholera is actually, um, the bacterium, the Vibrio, is actually quite responsive to climate change, primarily through a certain vector of transmission that most people wouldn't think about, but algae blooms. And one of the interesting things about algae blooms is that um, as sea surface temperature warms, it's going to hit certain thresholds. And at those threshold points, algae is going to explode, all right? in terms of its, its proliferation. And then, of course, the algae blooms drift across the ocean. As they drift across the ocean, they often carry the bacteria within them. So you can see some very odd um, transmission patterns related to uh, not only ocean currents, but also sea surface temperatures. Um, again, this is highly responsive to the El Nino Southern o Oscillation Modulation, right? Um, perhaps I should explain that for you guys. The El Nino cycle, as you know, causes enormous variation, not only in terms of temperature, but also in rainfall right, every few years. And one of the things that's fascinating is that with that modulation, you see different pathogens and diseases responding to that, irrespective of housing, right, population movements, and so forth. So this is where we get the clearest signal, I think, because it's a relatively short time frame, and it's a relatively significant modulation that does show up in the incidence of various pathogens. All right, schistosomiasis, another interesting illness. Um, it is a blood leech. Some of you may be familiar with it. I hope you never catch it. It's absolutely horrible. Prevalent in tropics and, and temporal zones. Most people think that schistosomiasis is only prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa. No, it's also prevalent in the Caribbean. So you have to be very careful. The vector is the snail, Oncomelania. Um, and obviously, there's an optimal temperature range for the vector from 15 to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, what's going to happen here is that climate change is, in fact, shifting the distribution of the snails, right, in terms of temperature and in terms of rainfall to affect new populations. But drier areas are seeing declines in infections. So what this means, essentially, if you'll, and we'll go back to the maps in a second, if you think about the drying out of certain regions of Africa, that's pushing schistosomiasis out of those regions, but schistosomiasis is being pushed into other regions like East Asia, right? So it's not the disease is necessarily expanding its range, but rather shifting to affect different populations. Dengue fever is something I've been interested in, uh, and dengue hemorrhagic fever, something I've been interested in for a while. Um, I did a little run of the data over the past decade uh, from the Americas, 
And in fact, increasing disease, disease levels from dengue in the Americas actually exceed population growth rates and they exceed migration uh, levels too. Obviously, we have to dig deeper on that, but that's um, interesting. The spikes in the infection mortality correlate to a considerable degree with El Nino. Um, and that effect is also observed in Southeast Asia too. Recent epidemics in the last few years, you've seen um, significant military involvement in Brazil just a few years ago to shut down a raging uh, dengue epidemic down there. Also in Bolivia in order to ensure containment. So dengue is a real problem. It's very sporadic in terms of exploding in epidemics, uh, but it does happen. All right, and I'll come back to this. Um, so. One of the interesting debates that I got into when I was at Oxford is, is uh, a couple years ago is that several people said, well, we all know that disease doesn't produce any externalities, such as economic damage. And I thought, well, that was a very interesting comment. Um, why, would, why would an otherwise very educated individual make such a comment? Um, there seems to be kind of this increasing belief in, in, at least in some European circles, that diseases don't generate externalities such as fear or economic damage. Mm. Well, I would contest that. And um, there's actually been a lot of work done on externalities. Jeffrey Sachs, for example, the famous economist from Harvard now at Columbia, did a lot of work on malaria over the years. And others have done work on SARS. The SARS epidemic of uh, 2002, 2003 actually generated $20 billion, 20 to $40 billion in damage to trade throughout the Asia Pacific region. So there's quite a bit of evidence to um, actually show that it does produce, ex disease does produce externalities. Um, in terms of economic outcomes, I'd like to go back to Fogel's work for a second. Fogel argued that health was a central driver of human productivity. Now, why? Why does that make sense? Well, if you have greater nutrition, which is something he looked at coming in, right, and if you diminish the levels of disease in a given society, you're going to increase the economic productivity of those people. But it goes beyond that, right? Some of you may know already that um, increased nutrition and health are basic drivers of accelerated human cognitive development. In other words, your brains develop better as you can pull in nutrients and so forth, right? In societies that have an enormous burden of disease, cognition actually suffers from this. And there are numerous studies of this from, for example, Jamaica, right, where we looked at multiple cohorts of children. Some of them um, were, uh, had worms like whipworm and hookworm eradicated. They did much better downstream in terms of their educational attainment than the other groups that did not have the worms eradicated. Okay? So there's quite a bit of, of work on this. <coughs> If you flip Fogel around, all right, it's relatively easy to see that, well, if you're ill, if you're truly ill with something like schistosomiasis or malaria, it's going to impede your productivity. Uh, it's going to cut into your savings and investment, either in direct, or, through direct or indirect mechanisms. It's going to result in increasing worker absenteeism, and absenteeism, medical costs, and even premature death. So in terms of economic outcomes, when you think about global climate change, there may be winners and losers in this. How does the winner side work? Well, if you think about schistosomiasis, right, the blood leach is shifting as, pop, as areas drive out, certain populations may see diminished levels of schistosomiasis through aridity. That's a boon for them, right? Quite obviously, I mean, a horrendous disease will be moving out of that region. That's great, right? They should see greater economic productivity and economic growth. On the other hand, uh, a lot of societies are going to be affected in a very negative fashion by the spread of these pathogens and parasites into, uh, into them because they have little immunological naivete. Okay. Here's some hard data on this. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but the top one that's most interesting is on a macro level impact, malaria generates a 1.3% drag on GDP per capita per annum, and that's global. That's from Jeffrey Sachs and Pia Mullaney of Harvard, 2002, right? Now, if you stretch a 1.3% drag on GDP per capita per annum, and then you apply that to societies in the developing world, that's an enormous drag upon economic productivity from one pathogen, right? Um, and obviously, it's really going to slow down those societies' capacities to, to develop effectively. 
Um, similarly, Gallup and, and, and Sachs flipped that around a little earlier. They found that a 10% decline in incidence of malaria actually resulted in, guess what, a 0.3 increase in GDP per capita in those affected societies. So dealing with malaria, long-term economic benefits that are, of course, cumulative. All right. And there are numerous, uh, numerous case studies in this. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that inequities are really problematic in all of this. The burden of disease falls to a much greater degree upon the global poor for rather obvious reasons, right? I mean, they have less access to health care, typically poorer housing and so forth. And what we're finding is that disease actually exacerbates, right, the gulf between classes, right, particularly in those societies where GDP per capita is less than $20,000 per year. That's problematic in terms of governance because you don't want enormous economic rifts between classes if you want a stable, uh, politically stable society. Okay. Uh, briefly, here's a theoretical construct um, from uh, one of my earlier volumes about the interactivity between pathogens, state and society, and, and so forth. We can come back to that in the question period uh, if you want to. So in, in terms of climate change, one of the peculiar and nonlinear effects we're observing is that, in, in fact, it can result in the collapse of entire ecosystems, right? That's really problematic because when you shift an entire ecosystem structure from one equilibrium to another in terms of collapse, you're going to see certain microbial um, agents fill ecological niches. And what that means is that we're likely to see the emergence right, of new pathogens into the human ecology right, through massive change of ecosystems. Um, I can explain emergent properties quickly for you, you guys. Um, notice the water here that Alyssa was kind enough to get me. All right? If we were to go over to the science labs and uh, get a little electrical current and fracture the water into its constituent parts, what would we get? What's its chemical composition? Hydrogen and oxygen, right, okay. And hydrogen and oxygen at room temperature in their natural state are what form? They're gaseous, right? Okay, so if you were from another planet and you had never seen water before and you saw its constituent parts, oxygen right, and hydrogen in gaseous form, would you ever think that combining them together would produce the quality of wetness? No, you wouldn't. Wetness is an emergent property resulting from the combination of hydrogen and oxygen in that form. Right? Similarly, if we were to go over to the freezer over there and we were to freeze this, again, you see another emergent property, something that you would not predict um, right off the bat. Because most substances, like uh, hmm, if we had an apple here, most substances when you freeze them, what happens to their volume? Shrinks, right? Contracts. Water, the opposite. Again, that's an emergent property that you would never predict having never seen water or ice before. All right? Well, in this sense, emergent properties then um, are qualitatively different outcomes that you could not predict from simply looking at a system's constituent parts. Diseases or disease emergence also can function along this line of emergent properties in the sense that you could look at disparate mechanisms combining together to suddenly produce the release of an entirely new, new pathogen. Right? And people will say, well, what's a good example of that? Well, I think the influenza of 1918, which grew so incredibly virulent, expressed emergent uh, properties in the sense that the war, the First World War, which brought together millions of young, uh, young soldiers in trenches, in boxcars, in ships, allowed for the virus to spread faster and faster and faster. And we know that increased transmission rates lead to greater properties of lethality in pathogens. So the war, in a sense, allowed for the emergence of a highly virulent virus that then devastated the planet, killed around 50 million people. OK. Um, I'll come back to some of those points later. So in terms of conclusions, and then we'll open it up to questions, because that'll be a lot of fun. Disease can be seen as a stressor to state capacity, 
Uh, is it going to overwhelm nations? Well, it's not going to overwhelm the USA because we have enormous resilience, enormous capacity, and so forth. But will the proliferation of disease uh, seriously stress out those societies with under $20,000 per annum per, uh, per capita GDP? I, I think it, it may. Uh, is it a threat to human security? Arguably, yes, depending upon how we define human security, which is in itself a rather nebulous concept, but we can discuss that. Um, Sociopolitical destabilization is possible from the proliferation of disease, but I'd say it's highly contingent on a mixture of factors. Right? You can't make broad generalizations that, oh, climate change is going to cause the spread of pathogens globally, and that's going to destabilize everywhere. I mean, that's a nonsensical claim. But when we dig down and we look at certain regions of the world, indeed certain polities, and think about, if you want, the, the pathogen mix that affects those, those societies and their levels of socioeconomic development, yeah, you can make certain claims that some societies will be vulnerable. Areas at greatest risk, again, subtropical to temperate zones, south, parts of South America, East Asia, Southern Africa, and South America. Um, more evidence to back this, in fact, comes from recent studies that found a number of arboviruses uh, are, in fact, related to global climate change. West Nile, right? That's interesting. Uh, chikungunya virus, which most of you probably haven't heard of. Rift Valley fever and, and blue tongue virus, all of these viruses seem to be related to some signal coming out of climate change in the last few years. Okay? Again, that needs, in my opinion, that needs to be tested a little bit more, um, but initial studies by Gould and Hicks are uh, revelatory on that. Conceptually, what can help us in dealing with these problems of the present and the future? Well, first is uh, by Cass Sunstein, who's a legal scholar at the University of Chicago. Sunstein talked about a principle called probability neglect, which is, and we can all read along, the persistent inability of most humans to respond in rational fashion to dire yet very low probability risks. We, as a species, have a very hard time grasping um, risks that are extremely low probability, yet the implications of something like that happening are enormous. Uh, we, we have a hard time processing that and engaging it. Furthermore, Imagination cost, which is linked to this. We have a difficulty thinking about phenomena beyond our experiences. Right? This goes back to cognitive psychology and indeed to political psychology, which is a subfield of, of political science, as you know. Um, humans tend to engage in heuristics. We have established belief structures and so forth. We even have images of self and other. We try to fit information about the world into our pre-existing heuristics and models. So we base all of our thinking upon those patterns. And when we try to contemplate something outside our experience, we have a very difficult time getting there cognitively. That makes sense. It applies to everyone. Um, one of the fascinating things that I've seen from digging into some of the climate data is that we're now apparently moving into a phase of what we call turbulence. Right? Human civilizations emerged over the past 10,000 years. Right? So if you think about civilization as it stands right now, it's a product of what we might call equilibrium one. Okay? We're moving from equilibrium one into a phase of climate turbulence. And physicists and chemists have said, well, ultimately, we'll pass through that phase of turbulence into an, a new equilibrium. Well, just to kind of put a, a blunt, be as blunt as I can about it, if you're moving from the original equilibrium into turbulence in a new equilibria, then you're going to probably see the emergence of new types of pathogens. And that wouldn't be surprising at all, because microbes are very, very adept at colonizing new ecological niches. And some of these microbes we probably will not have seen before. OK. So let's open it up to questions. And uh, thank you very much for having me. Yes. If you had a calculation based on a GDP per capita of twenty thousand dollars, that was some sort of threshold. Yeah. How many countries have a GDP per capita over twenty thousand? Not not many. Not many. That's right. Right. So that's not a huge pot for me. Okay. No, that's I mean that's so 
Right. They all fall below that threshold. The vast majority. That's right. Name one that fills the gap threshold. Probably Switzerland. But that's, no, I said developing countries. Oh, developing countries. Oh, no, that's right. Well, that's, that's one of the things that we need to do, in fact, is unpack that data. If I can get back to this slideshow here. Um, yeah, all I'm trying to say is that if that is a threshold for our capacity to manage disease, um, it's not really a threshold for the development of disease. No one meets that standard. Well, that's right. No, and, that, and that's right. And that's one of the problems with Lafferty is that Lafferty's data just looked at the entire planet as this, you know, in, in this kind of ubiquitous fashion and didn't differentiate between societies. And of course, when you look back at Lafferty now, you would say, well, obviously there are going to be differential effects depending upon income structure. So, you know, even though Lafferty's um, article is a, a fascinating critique, um, again, it's not terribly robust. And, and that's one of the reasons that, um, and I'll try to find that again, that uh, we have, uh, yeah, where was it? Well, I'll find it. There we go. There we go. Okay. so. That's the article by uh, Beguin et al., 2011. And if you, if you guys want to contact me at, at CC, just you know, shoot me an email sometime, and I'll, I'll forward you the uh, references on this. Great. Good. Other questions? Yeah. Right. Well, when you look at, at the last question, you know, where are these new pathogens likely to flourish? Again, in the developing world, where it, which is precisely where our surveillance systems are, are least robust. And so, yeah, that's an enormous concern to me because some people you know, that I talk to say, oh, don't worry, we'll detect it if it arises in, inside the USA. Well, that, that misses the point entirely, right? Because most of the proliferation of, of new zoonoses is probably going to occur outside the OECD countries in the poorest. And um, obviously, this takes us into the realm of you know, where do we need to make greater investments, not only in health surveillance, but also in public health infrastructure. The surveillance system, in terms of computers, could be rather robust. But if you don't have nurses on the ground, that are actually you know, picking up on, on trends in public health, and of course physicians too, you're gonna miss a lot of the picture. And we see that all the time. In my work on Sub-Saharan Africa uh, about a decade ago, for example, I was just astonished at how the data gaps were just so enormous between various countries. Some like South Africa were relatively good, but other regions of, of Sub-Saharan Africa, the data was just non-existent. And so something could emerge, and we wouldn't even know about it for some time. Right. Good. Other questions? Yeah. OK. Well, right. Again, that's, that's an excellent question in the sense that we only have the data that we have to work with in terms of our analysis. And given these enormous gaps in data and in surveillance, sure, you can question a lot of this uh, material that's come out. But what all that really means is that we have to develop greater surveillance systems and collect better data in order to keep running the analysis. Because as students and, and as a faculty member, unfortunately, we're vulnerable to the um, the realist uh, position in the sense that you have to work with what you've got. You know? So I actually think it's going to improve over the longer term, but it's, it's tough to generalize at this point, which is also why people like Lafferty, who say there is no correlation, again, you, you have to say to Lafferty, well, again, that's premature. You can't make that argument, especially when you don't differentiate between rich and poor countries. Yeah. Okay. Lissa? Um, that's tricky, of course, because you, you don't have any direct mechanisms <coughs> of, of effect in that sense, but you might have some indirect mechanisms. Um, if climate change, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa 
is going to result in drought, in declining nutrition, okay, then that can affect the basal health of populations. And you could argue, and in fact many do, that that'll make you vulnerable to colonization by a whole range of pathogens, of which HIV would be one. The other thing that might result, though, that, that I've thought about is that as people are driven into greater and greater poverty by things like drought, um, they're going to change their social practices, indeed their economic practices, in order to make money to survive. And if people are changing their, um, their practices and engaging in more trade of sex and so forth like that, in order to just get by, obviously that could accelerate the proliferation of something like HIV. So climate won't directly affect HIV transmission, but it could very much indirectly affect it through a number of ways. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the migration argument is, is compelling, too. Um, although it's funny, in Sub-Saharan Africa, if I can get back to that slide, if you look at, if you look at the temperature data there, um, what we're, of course, seeing is a lot of migration from the Sahel region, both south and also north into Europe. The interesting thing about the Sahel, though, is that's not where HIV is concentrated, really. So. Um, similarly with North Africa, now again, the, the data may be tweaked by governments and we, we won't know sh for sure, but um, populations from North Africa, which tend to be Muslim, don't tend to have high concentrations of HIV. What would be interesting though and, and problematic is if in the southern cone of Africa where HIV is, is very deeply concentrated, if that starts to be affected and then you see movements of those individuals up into Europe, that's going to change transmission patterns. Good. Is that cool? All right. Other questions? Micah? Or we'll go around. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, I'm in a climate change adaptation course right now. So okay. I'm a lot about uh, getting people, how people are going to change their livelihoods, like you just mentioned, and that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. you talk a lot about is adaptation just development, and is there a difference there? And it seems to me that in this case, the only way that they can adapt to this is to develop their health systems. Right. Well, that's that's an enormous problem because that comes back to the state capacity issue, which is um, different societies are going to differ are going to exhibit differential levels of capacity to adapt to this. Obviously, one would expect that the richer nations, the OECD nations, will exhibit much greater capacity and therefore adaptability. Um, that may not be true necessarily, though. I mean, that's a bit of an oversimplification because poorer societies on the planet may just adopt different strategies of coping at the social level that might be more effective. In other words, the USA. I mean, we may just throw money at the problem, uh, which, of course, has turned out frequently to be the inappropriate uh, way of looking at things. I think that when you look at the developing countries, that are, as I mentioned before, are going to be most vulnerable, though, their lack of capacity really is problematic. And um, what I think it means over the longer term is that the richer countries are going to have to face up to the fact that if they want to you know, remain, quote, protected from emergent zoonoses and so forth, they're simply going to have to contribute greater resources to shoring up the healthcare infrastructure um, and livelihoods of people in the developing world. That's the, the trade off. And, um, it, this gets us into the question of public goods, right? At, at what point is, is global health a public good? Well, I think so. And um, how does that work? Well, it works in the sense that the health of people in country A uh, is going to affect the health of people in country B and country C. If you're, if you're a hegemonic actor like the United States of America, right, and hegemons like the USA and Britain historically have always kind of invested in public goods, um, let me give you an example of that. The British waged a war on piracy on the oceans for you know, decades, trying to wipe out the pirates, which were um, affecting their international trade. Even though they were the ones bearing the costs, the British, for that war on piracy, the French and the Spanish and others all benefited from it. So the British were providing a public good to the world in general. In the same sense, if the USA invests in global public health, they're providing a public good, right? But it makes sense for them to do so because over the longer term, by providing health to other societies, you're going to uh, increase their economic productivity, 
which is going to increase global economic productivity. Uh, you are going to um, increase markets for American goods. You're ostensibly going to stabilize many of these uh, destabilized political regions in the world through better health care and, and economic progress. So it makes sense for the U.S. to invest in global health. And, and people would say to me, well, you're framing it through self-interest instead of norms and morals. And, and my point is, yeah. Because when I have to go to Washington and when I have to try to convince people in D.C. that it makes sense to invest in global health, you don't want to hit them with morals and norms. As you probably know, that doesn't work in Washington, D.C. But if you can show them that, look, it's in the U.S.'s own advanced self-interest to help other people right, over the longer term. It's going to be better for us. Uh, they tend to buy that argument. Does that help? It's a little easier with, I, yeah, I was kind of thinking about that because I think that you talked about what was it, imagination costs and this neglect thing, and I think that's very easy with things like rising, you know, uh, moving coastal areas in another country. You, I think it's hard for people to imagine that, but something like health that can move around the world mm -hmm. or health problems, I think that's a little bit easier for the U.S. to buy into and or its obligations. Right. In, in fact, you know, this issue has become securitized at the highest levels in the USA. That's a very interesting debate in and of itself. Um, you know, even, even though, uh, obviously, this is an enormous development issue, right, and that's the frame that I typically like to come at it from, the question is, well, should we now see the proliferation of pathogens in the, develop in the developing world through the lens of security? Um, unfortunately, we always have. If you go back over the centuries, my last book, I went back about 700, 800 years. Um, for a very long time, starting in Italy in 1348, political entities started to securitize health um, because the physicians of the time proved um, less than adept at containing the emergence of the Black Death and it destabilized Italian society. That type of vision um, has persisted over the centuries. So even within the USA, the National Intelligence Council, the U.S. Department of Defense, all view the, prolifer the emergence and prolifer proliferation of new pathogens um, as security risks. Again, it's problematic because there is this tension between developmental um, you know, uh, priorities and security priorities. Sometimes they mesh, but sometimes they don't. And obviously, when you're talking about the global burden of illness, you know, I, I know colleagues in D.C. who said, well, you know, clearly the security services should get involved. No, not clearly. It may be a security issue, but that doesn't mean that the best responders to the emergence of a disease are people in the military or our intelligence services. They're nurses. They're doctors. Those are the people who need to be out there doing this work, even if it is a security issue. Sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. Okay, great. Uh, Micah? Yeah, going off of Jessica's question and mm -hmm. kind of returning to your conclusion with the speech about um, probability and neglect and imagination costs, which right. to me kind of returns to like the theme this week's work, um, you know, black hole, black swan theory, right. and the art of the possible. And so part of that is like, how do you take these black swan events, these like low probability, high impact events, like emerging properties and epidemics, right. and from a policy standpoint, look at how to turn these black swan events into gray swans such that you can now either better position uh, states or policy or viewing health as a public good from a demonic standpoint. What does policy look like to address these issues that now that we have the ability to look at that and say like this, this will, you know, the probability of this occurring, we can get over that probability of neglect because we understand that it can occur without external policy. Right. Okay. So that's actually a fascinating question is how do you anticipate the future in this realm of, of nonlinearities, of thresholds, of complex emergence and so forth? And the answer is, well, you can't. You can't necessarily. So what can you do? All right. Well, the first thing you can do is we can all dig into it like this and look at the emerging trends that exist and the data that exists on the table. And we can, in fact, make some some specific recommendations that, A, we are going to see black swan pathogens emerge. So you will see the emergence of new pathogens. You're not going to be able to predict the exact you know, type, typology of them, 
Um, they might even be new classes of pathogens, like prions, you know, the infectious proteins that emerged over the last couple of decades in Britain, bovine spongiform encephalopathy and all of that, right? So you can't predict the exact nature of these new pathogens, but what you can do is you can say the probability of them emerging in some form is very high, even though we don't know exactly what form they're going to take. Right. So then the next step is to say, okay, given that we're going to see some surprises, what can we do to shore up our defenses? Well, then, obviously, one of the things we can do is invest in resilience, societal resilience. And what does that mean? That means that, at least in the USA, you have to have better surveillance mechanisms. As you all know, we have a shortage of nurses in this country, right? That's not helpful. As you all know, we also have a shortage of, of physicians, and we have a very severe shortage of public health personnel, right? All of those things actually introduce fragility into our healthcare surveillance and, uh, systems, but not just the surveillance systems, also the, the care systems that exist. In the event of a major outbreak like 1918, the influenza again, um, I've seen a number of studies done by our own federal government that say that, listen, we're just, we're simply not there yet in terms of being equipped to deal with that on a human level, uh, in terms of the respirators, in terms of the beds available because our, our current healthcare system, uh, which is run according to a just-in-time model, right, um, doesn't have a lot of resilience. It's very fragile, right? It's run to maximize what? Economic efficiency, not resilience. And so that's one thing, Micah, we could do right off the bat, in fact, is invest in greater and more resilient systems for healthcare um, throughout the OECD. Now, obviously, this is gonna entail what? Resources, right? Money. And, you know, we're going to have to make some trade-offs. So when we think about spending on, on these types of initiatives, that becomes tricky. But I think at the end of the day, spending on health makes a lot more sense than spending on some other um, certain uh, things that we have a, a predilection for in this government, you know. Um, the other thing, obviously, is taking it outside a U.S.-based context. Well, how do we deal with this in the developing world? I think that one of the problems in the developing world is, um, is that we don't focus enough on the low-hanging fruit in terms, of, and, I, and here I'm talking about the U.S. And, and, um, and the WHO. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. Back in the 1990s, HIV AIDS became pretty much securitized in Washington, right? And so, and it made sense at the time because we were very worried that HIV would destabilize these populations through massive morbidity, mortality, economic losses, and so forth. That didn't really happen to the extent that some had envisioned it. But what it did do is it directed massive flows of capital towards what? Towards HIV AIDS and away from other illnesses. Okay? That's actually quite problematic because what are we seeing now is that even as we're treating HIV AIDS, which is good, we're neglecting a whole range of other diseases, right? A whole spectrum of illnesses, which also kill and debilitate people, such as malaria. Just a couple weeks ago, I don't know if any of you saw this, but the BBC News reported that malaria deaths were about twice as high, in fact, as had been previously estimated. So again, when we, <clears throat> when we think about you know, introducing resilience you know, to deal with these new pathogens, we also have to think about, well, where are our current resource flows going? If so much of our resource flows are going into HIV, that's going to detract from treating malaria, schistosomiasis, onchocerciasis, leishmaniasis, so on and so forth, right? And one has to wonder, well, where is the money going to come from to treat these new emergent pathogens? The only way to do it, in my opinion, is to invest in robust surveillance systems that track a whole host of number of different types of pathogens and diseases, right? And you invest in general resilience of these healthcare systems. Is it going to cost the US money, Canada money, um, the Europeans money to shore up these uh, systems in the developing world? Yes, it is. And that's just the way it goes. You know? Yeah, thanks, Micah. Anything else? Other questions? Yes? Since you started talking about this, we have $100 billion. <laughs> How did that happen? Okay. <laughs> Right. One in 
Well, and of course that's the million dollar question and, and thanks for asking it because it is the tough one. Um, I admit, I have to confess, I'm a little biased because I've been studying public health for so long. Um, but I'm also studying climate change in general now and I hate, I hate to say it but if you're looking at limited resources and bang for your buck, I think investing in basic public health for people is going to have a greater payoff in the next 20 to 30 years than trying to slow down climate change. Why do I feel that way? Well, and I, do, and I don't like saying that because I wish we could slow down climate change. As you may have noticed from the last round of talks to deal with uh, global climate change initiatives, um, you know, the US and, and China were basically now on board, but what was the blocking entity that prevented it? It was in fact, in this case, India. And if you're gonna have multiple powers around the world, rising powers like India, China, Brazil, the USA, which is already established in, in, in others, constantly shifting and blocking any accord through mechanisms of power, then we could pour billions into global climate change alleviation efforts, and all it takes is a couple of those enormous nations to basically you know, throw everything we've done under the bus. Investing in global health, though, has a much greater bang for the buck, in my opinion. If you took that same amount of money and invested it in uh, health care for women, um, you know, and, and just basic things like sanitation, um, you know, the provision of uh, antimicrobials to treat things like tuberculosis and so forth, the payoff is going to be much greater. Now, I, I, it really aggravates me, actually, that we can't do a better job in dealing with, with, with these complex uh, global collective action issues like climate change. But at the end of the day, it's going to take everybody working together. With global health, you don't need everybody simultaneously working together to get something done. You, we can do this on a much you know, finer micro level scale. You can make advances in certain regions that don't depend upon whether the Chinese agree with you or not. Right? Again, I, I confess, I am biased. I would much rather help people you know, through those low cost interventions. But it's a great question. Thanks. Any other points or questions? Great. Well, listen, thanks very much, and I look forward to seeing all of you in the future. If you have any further questions about the material, the sources, or what have you, please uh, shoot me an email. I'm just down the road. There's my email right there, aps at coloradocollege.edu. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>